So, okay, now we're ready. I have the honor to introduce Andrea to you. Clearly, everybody knows very well who is Andrea, but, and also I've been told five minutes ago, so I didn't have the time to spend one day to study Andrea CV, which is very large. I will tell you just two things. Andrea is basically now a, I say, double headed Pisa Roma guy. I mean, he comes from Pisa and this stays with him, but he's from Roma now because he's been so much time with us. And uh, as you can read, so I mean, uh, Andrea is a personality, a remarkable personality in this sense. Also, Andrea always works on very interesting things. I mean, this is uh, very nice. And he, he does both numeric and analytic, this kind of numerics that you really love. And you say, I would have liked to be myself to uh, use numerics to understand this field. So when you see a paper of Andrea, you really want to read him, it. And so I thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, I think you should turn it on. Yeah, OK. give this talk. And uh, what I will try to do during this seminar is some kind of pedagogical introduction to a couple of papers, not just the only paper which is written in the title, but to a couple of papers which essentially deal with uh, perturbation theory, essentially in statistical mechanics systems. Uh, how should I go on? Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. So these are the two papers which are mentioned. The first one is the paper which is mentioned in the title of the talk, which is Perturbative Theory Without Gauge Fixing with Wu. But it's a second paper that I want to mention at the same time, which also deals with perturbation theory. This paper apparently has much less citation than, citations than the first one, but for a very simple reason that the paper was essentially written in 1973 in a conference proceeding. And then it was published only seven years later. And in those seven years, most of the applications were done so that they didn't really quote, cite the, the JSTAT fees paper because the paper was not out. So they just were just referring to the Carges uh, paper, which is not indexed. So apparently this paper is not very well cited. It has, I checked something like 300 citations. But probably the total number of citations is much larger because you should also add those citations which have been obtained in those seven years in which most of the activity was done. So I want to remember these two papers which have been essential. The second one has, been, has played an important role in my research for many years. And so this is why I'm essentially, uh, I want to, to speak about a little bit of it too. So let's first discuss the paper with Wu on the uh, stochastic quantization. And uh, the idea here is that of defining a field theory by means of a stochastic process. So what is a field theory? Essentially a field theory is the, the theory which I've written here. So we are referring to first Euclidean field theory. We're not speaking about Minkowski field theory. So we imagine that the Minkowski field theory has been uh, big rotated in such a way to obtain a theory in Euclidean. So all dimensions are Euclidean. There are no, uh, there are no, I mean, the, the metric, uh, the distance metric is just the usual Euclidean one. So there is nothing there. And second, we're using the path integral approach in the Euclidean, which turns the field theory into a statistical mechanics model. Mm -hmm. So the theory here that I will just speak about for a few slices, it's just the standard phi four theory in which you have a scalar field phi, which interacts with a potential V of phi. And what we want to compute are average values with respect to the distribution, which is E to minus S. S in this language, in this field is called the action, but you can usually think, you can think of it as a, a Hamiltonian. And Z is the partition function, the normalizing factor. And for instance, we want to compute the two point function which is a correlation of two fields at different points. This is the quantity that, for instance, we want to compute. So what is the idea of stochastic quantization? Is that of defining the theory in terms of a dynamic process. 
So the idea is that you take your field phi, which is a function of the position x, and you add an additional time variable t, and then you consider the Langevin equation. The Langevin equation, of course, we all know it because it's just the standard way of describing random, uh, random processes, for instance, Brown in motion. And of course, there is a noise term, which is Gaussian, uncorrelated. And as you can see, the two eters have correlation zero when the points are different or times are different. And I didn't write the fact that it's a Gaussian. So we know also the four point function, the six point function, the eight point function. We just use the standard rules for Gaussian distributions. And uh, the important result is that if you take equal time correlations, hmm, so you consider the dynamics, whatever is the starting point of the dynamics, equal time correlations converge to the field theory correlations in the limit, in the limit of large times. So you take the limit t goes to infinity, and you see that the equal time correlations converge towards the field theory estimates. So this equality is uh, here the result of a more general result. The more general result is obtained by using the Fokker-Planck equation, which essentially tells you that the distribution, the probability distribution at time t converges to the field theory distribution as t goes to infinity. And there is nothing very special about the Langevin dynamics. Indeed, you can take any other Markov process that has uh, the, the equilibrium, the, the field theory, equilibrium distribution as stationary distribution, and you will obtain exactly the same result. But there is one important point here. I mean, up to here, there is nothing very special, but the paper advertises the fact that this method is appropriate to do perturbation theory without gauge fixing. And this is indeed where uh, the interest of the paper lays. So let's see what is the meaning first of a gauge fixing? So let's imagine we have a world in which only photons are present. So we only have the electromagnetic field. Doesn't matter if you, you can add, of course, matter fields. Uh, nothing changes here, but for simplicity, let's imagine we only have the photons. So the basic field is uh, the A, the vector potential plus phi, so the A mu in four dimensions. And then, of course, the action is defined in terms of the electromagnetic field F mu nu, which is d mu a nu minus d mu a nu. And so this is the, the action. And we all know that in electromagnetism, there is an invariance, which is called gauge invariance, local invariance, local gauge invariance. And this local gauge invariance tells you that the F mu nu is invariant if the potentials are transformed in that way. If you add to a nu, the, uh, the gradient of a scalar function, lambda, the gradient in four dimension, of course. And uh, this gauge invariance has, gives rise to an important problem. The partition function is no longer defined. The partition function is strictly infinite because of the presence of these zero modes. So Z is exactly equal to infinity. So apparently the, the model which describes the standard interactions of charged particles with an electromagnetic field is not well defined. So what is the standard way out? The standard way out is that of introducing a gauge fixing. The gauge fixing is a function g of x of a, which is defined on each side of uh, your space. And we will need what is called a complete gauge fixing. Complete gauge fixing means that it completely fixes the gauge. Essentially, if we have two, imagine that we have by uh, A and A prime, they both satisfy the gauge fixing condition. So G of X of the function A and G of X of the function A prime are both zero on all points. And A and A prime are connected by a gauge transformation, then necessarily A is equal to A prime. So there is no way given a function A that satisfies the gauge fixing condition to obtain by using gauge transformations, a different A prime that also satisfies the gauge fixing condition. So this is the, the sense of completeness. So we do a simple trick, which is the usual one. So imagine that we just consider gauge invariant correlations. So we have a function F of A. 
And then we do a trick. We multiply everything by that uh, quantity, which is called, that starts there from J. Does this, does this work? Doesn't work. Yes. Where is it? <laughs> oh, yes. Now, now I see it. So you see here this interval which starts from J. Okay, we add this quantity here. So the quantity, here, what is this J here? Well, there is an important point that this is, of course, a collection of delta function. So there is a Jacobian which is involved here. We imagine that G of X is a linear function of, the, of, uh, of A, there is a Jacobian, and the completeness relation is the one that guarantees you that the Jacobian is non-vanishing, because we need something which is non-vanishing. So the non-vanishing condition of the Jacobian is ensured by a complete gauge fix. If the gauge fix is not complete, the Jacobian is zero, and then everything does not make any sense. So we need a complete gauge fixing. The Jacobian is finite, and then we just multiply by J, which is the inverse of the Jacobian, so that we are just adding one, hmm? nothing there. So we are adding a factor of one. And then what we do is just make a gauge transformation. So we redefine the fields A prime is equal A plus the gradient of lambda. In this way here, we have A prime, and then the integral of D lambda goes there. Hmm? So we, you see here that nothing is well defined because now we have. This integral here is the product of something which is well-defined times, some, times something which is obviously infinite. Infinite because lambda goes from minus infinity to plus infinity for each point x. And so it's an integral which goes to infinity. It's exactly infinite for all points. So here you immediately see why it's not well-defined, you know, this integral in the absence of a gauge fix. But now remember that the average value is obtained by taking the ratio of this quantity here by this quantity here. And of course, I can rewrite this quantity exactly in the same way. In this way, when I take the ratio, these two factors cancel out. So at the end, when I take the ratio, the divergent quantities cancel out. And in this way, I obtain something which is well-defined. So the theory now becomes well-defined in the presence of a gauge fixing. Without gauge fixing, Electrodynamics is not defined. So what is the idea of the stochastic quantization? Is that we can avoid this uh, problem by using the dynamics. Hmm? I can implement the Langevin dynamics for electrodynamics. And in this case, the dynamics is well-defined even in the absence of a gauge fixing. The dynamics is well-defined, and so I have a non-perturbative definition of the theory, which does not require the, the gauge fixing. And uh, of course, uh, there is a problem. So we are solving the problem completely? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Because you, we know that uh, to obtain the field theory estimate, we have to take the limit t goes to infinity. So the dynamics is well defined for any finite values of t, but then there is the limit. So what is the main outcome? The main outcome is that if you take gauge invariant observables, these observables thermalize. Thermalize means they have a well-defined uh, large time limit. Not complete, I will discuss a little subtlety in the next slide, but let's say it works. All gauge invariant quantities have a well-defined limit. Instead, if you take non-gauge invariant quantities, these quantities do not have a large term limit. Essentially, they make a random walk hmm, in space. And you know that random walk is a nice mark of process that in infinite space does not have a large time uh, probability distribution. Hmm? So it's well defined, the mark, of, the, the mark of process for the random walk. But of course, you cannot discuss, uh, you cannot obtain something meaningful in the limit in which you take t going to infinity. So this is the way in which essentially the problem is solved. The subtlety, the subtlety is interesting and is the following. There is 
an interesting class of observables in gauge theories that are obtained by making by taking uh, line integrals of the of a which a is effectively a vector field so we can integrate the vector field over closed loops and if you do this integral over closed loops of course this quantity is gauge invariant because if you take the integral of a gradient across, across a closed loop of course this gives zero so the contributions of the of the lambda function is zero on closed loops this quantity here if you take a, a loop in space is just you can just use standard theorems that are proved in uh, in second year courses to show this just the flux of the of the field of uh, the magnetic field if you interpret a as uh, the vector potential so there is nothing very special but something special happens if c is not a simply connected loop and how can you have not simply connected loops well imagine that to give a proper definition of any theorem of any theory you always have to work in a finite volume in a finite volume you have to choose boundary conditions of course mathematicians know the problem and so mathematicians typically choose open boundary conditions fixed boundary conditions that don't have the problems but physicists often take periodic boundary conditions for a very simple reason that if you take periodic boundary conditions you preserve translation invariance so you have something which is translation invariant but periodic boundary conditions have an unpleasant property that they have loops non-trivial loops that wrap around the lattice that are not simply connected something that you can shrink to zero to a point so there is there is an homotopy group which is not trivial on on the lattice uh, with periodic boundary conditions the example is of course a cylinder imagine that you're system is a two-dimensional cylinder and of course you can take circles around the cylinder and of course you cannot shrink those loops to a point they're just there and you integrate a over those loops of course this is a gauge invariant quantity but cannot be rewritten in terms of the fields so it's something it's a new observable gauge invariant but not related to the electromagnetic fields and if you look at the dynamics this quantity does not thermalize so we have when you use periodic boundary conditions we have gauge invariant observables that do not thermalize that are not well defined and of course this was for a long period overlooked but essentially 15 years ago people began doing simulations in uh, in uh, electrodynamics and of course this problem this problem came out and now we know that whenever we do what is called non-compact lattice electrodynamics you should use anti-periodic boundary conditions uh, because in anti-periodic boundary conditions uh, the wilson loops this is called the wilson loops are not gauge invariant so these the integrals uh, of the of the potential on non-trivial cycles are not gauge invariant so we don't care if they don't uh, thermalize so this is the only problem which which is in the approach and of course after the introduction of the paper several people began working in this field and there are several papers uh, the original paper was doing some one loop calculations but then Pluratos and uh, Iliopoulos studied the model in perturbation theory to all loops and they showed that everything renormalizes nicely so they proved the consist the perturbative consistency of this approach then uh, people began to think of this approach as a non-perturbative approach and so there were simulations doing using the Langevin equation which were started by by Batruni and Al and among the Al there was also Ken Wilson the, the, the Nobel Prize for the renormalization group and then in the last 25 years this approach has been turned into a numerical approach for computing higher loops uh, uh, calculate to doing higher loops calculations in QCD and uh, this approach works nicely for local quantities and now we have calculations of the average value of the plaquette in a lattice system in lattice QCD up to 10 loops which is certainly 
very huge number. I mean, 10 looks of in QCD is really astonishing as, as a number. But of course, it, but unfortunately, it doesn't really work for correlation function. This is the main limitation of this non, of this numerical stochastic perturbation theory. So this is the first paper, uh, stochastic quantization. And then let's speak about the second paper, which is the paper in which I was probably much more involved. And is, this paper is the paper doing what is called fixed dimension perturbation theory. From an historical perspective, let's put the numbers. The approach, the renormalization group approach of critical phenomena started, uh, well, I wasn't there, so I cannot really say something for sure, but late 60s, early 70s, I think, as far as I understand. And the real turning point was the paper, of course, we all know by Wilson and Fisher on the epsilon expansion, which used the renormalization group approach as a computational method to determine, for instance, critical exponents. And the idea was quite, quite new. And the idea was that uh, of uh, performing an analytic continuation in dimension and uh, use uh, epsilon, which was four minus D, D is the dimension of space. So we work in three dimensional space for statistical mechanics. So you, we do a, a perturbation in epsilon Epsilon is considered small, and at the end, we put epsilon equal to one. So there were various uh, uh, calculations, and the method was strongly relying on dimensional regularization, which was introduced by Toffel and Weltman just in the same period. The original approach was a little bit involved, but then it was significantly simplified by, by Zen Justin, Brezen, Leguiu, that did something which was more in the style of quantum field theory. And it's much simpler than, than the original integration in, uh, in momentum space. But the results are exactly the same. So next year, in the year 1973, Georgia proposed a new type of expansion, which is the fixed dimension expansion. The, the ugly part of the, of the epsilon expansion is that you need to do this analytic continuation. While here, the idea is to work exactly in the dimension you are interested in. So if you want to obtain the results in three dimensions, you do perturbative theory in three dimensions. So everything is much, uh, is much better defined. And so the idea is that we take, we generate perturbative expansions in terms of a dimension as renormalization group invariant uh, quantity. I call it G, as usually called G, as is a coupling. And, uh, the original proposal, G was simply the zero momentum rescaled four point function, which is defined there, is a quantity which has no dimension, no anomalous dimension, as if you look at the definition, because there are four fields on the numerator and four fields in the denominator. It has no uh, scale dimensions. There are three integrals on top, two integrals at the bottom, times the correlation length. Psi to the power D is again the dimension of volume. So we have three volumes on top, three volumes at bottom, four fields, four fields. So this is really a renormalization group invariant quantity. This was the original idea, the idea which is, which was, which is naturally used in perturbation theory. But in, in the, well, in the last 20 years, probably more, the same approach was used in a non-perturbative way considering a variety of renormalization group quantities. So people working in lattice field theory has invented a host of different renormalization group couplings, which are used in numerical work. They are nice to be used in, they can easily determine numerical works because first G is difficult to, to uh, generalize in uh, QCD, for instance, there is nothing like, there is nothing like G there is no easy G in QCD. And second, maybe it's not the, the quantity that we can determine easily in numerical simulations. But the idea is always the same. And uh, the idea is we do perturbation theory in terms of G, then we determine a quantity G star where the theory becomes scale invariant, the, the, the zero of the beta function, and then we compute all quantities that we are able to compute at G star. And this gives our, the predictions for, for, the, 
quantities that we want to, to determine. So this is the, the average, the approach. And this approach was very interesting for a very simple reason from a technical point of view. Calculations in epsilon expansions require you to deal with divergences. And divergences are tricky. Now we have several methods invented mainly by Russian groups, but in 1973, 75, it was quite difficult to do two loop calculation, three loop calculation, take into account all divergences. Well, in the fixed dimension expansion, the theory is super normalizable. So the number of diverging integrals is very small. It's trivial to rewrite everything just by doing some simple uh, substitutions, everything in terms of, of completely finite intervals. And then we can give these integrals to computer. It's amazing, but it was done on a computer even in those years. And then we can compute very long series. And you can see from the numbers here how the difficulty in doing the calculation showed up in the number of loops. After three years, 1975, there are the first three loop calculations. And we have to go to 83 with the, the group of Chetirkin to get five loop calculations, but six loop calculations appeared only a few years ago in 2016. And seven loop calculations are just a couple of years ago. While if you go back to the fixed dimension expansion, six loops were already reached in 1978. A complete full six loop calculation was done using the computers of 1978. It was an, I mean, an enormous effort done by the group of Nickel. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's really an amazing thing if you think how these quantities were computed at the time. And in 1991, there was already a seven loop calculation. So it was much easier at the time to do that. And people also did uh, two dimensional calculations. Four loops were again obtained in 1978. And now we have nine loops a few years ago by, by the CISA group. So now these quantities uh, are being computed to a very high number of loops. And in the last 30 years, there have been a very intense activity and all the series have been generalized to a variety of models, including uh, the finite temperature uh, transition in QCD, a variety of condensed matter models, uh, quantum transitions and everything. But there is a problem, of course, nothing comes free. Yeah? And the main problem is that these series are diverging. You do all these calculations, seven loop calculations, and you get this function. This is typical function. This is eta two of G. And we want to compute this function for G equal G star. So effectively we want to put G over G star equal to one and what get a number out of that. And you immediately see that there is a problem because this series, alternates in sign and the coefficients increase very rapidly. And so it seems hopeless. Hmm? If you do this series to a standard student, second year student, and you ask him, try to find the, the result, he will say, okay, I cannot give you any number because he plugs the numbers in. And if you take five number, five series, I mean, a five long, five loop series, you get something, seven loop, completely different number. No way to get anything. Uh, reasonable. And we know what the series should converge to because that quantity is related to standard exponents nu and eta in the Eisen model. So that series should provide you minus 0.381. And you immediately see if you try to do it, there is no way. Hmm? There is no way to get a, a reasonable number out of that series directly. But here there is again a trick, and George also worked on this, gave some important contributions in this field, and uh, is the following. First, these series are diverging. Hmm? The coefficients increase exponentially, uh, uh, exponentially, not, not exponentially, factorially, sorry, factorially, hmm? as a factorial. So gamma n plus b plus one, take b equal one, so it increases like n factorial. So the series increase factorially, and so they are not convergent. There is no way of doing it. But still, there is a very important property. Even though the series don't make any sense, if you try to put numbers in hmm, asymptotically, still the coefficients contain all the information 
that allow you to reconstruct the full function, provided that you know some important analyticity properties. Mm? So if you add to the knowledge of the series some additional analyticity properties, then you know that the knowledge of the coefficients allows you to obtain the function. And once you have the function, of course, you can compute the number. This is, this is the idea. So how does this work? So I will do some tricks that make no mathematical sense, but at the end provide you the correct answer. So imagine that you have a series, which is this one on top of that. So the coefficients is number a, then there is minus small a to the power n times n factorial. And so we want to resum this series. So the idea first is to use the representation of the gamma function. So the coefficient cn, I can rewrite in that way using the standard, where is it? Right. Using the standard representation of the gamma function. Then I insert it here. Notice that I'm just moving summations, integrals, swapping two things. I mean, mathematicians would be appalled about by what I'm doing here. It doesn't make any mathematical sense. But formally, this makes a sense. So I'm just plugging in this representation here, exchanging integrals and sums, and I get this sum. And now this sum, I know how to do it. At least in a disk, this sum converges is the usual uh, uh, geometric series. I resum it, and I get this quantity here. This quantity here is perfect, as long as, of course, A is a, pos is a, is a positive quantity here. Mm? As long as A is positive, this makes sense. So I have an integral, and this quantity is the function f of z that I want to compute. So you see, there is a series of tricks. They look like a trick, but of course, they have a mathematical justification under suitable analyticity properties that allow you to obtain the function. So the function here from the original coefficient. So for knowledge of the coefficients uh, allows you to reobtain some expression that encodes the full function f of z. This quantity here is called the, the Borel transform of the original series. And notice that here there is also an important step that the summation here only converges in the disk, while here, of course, I'm extending, I'm doing the analytic continuation in the, in the whole space, on the whole real line. So in technical terms, this means that we go from the original series to the Borel transform. We try to, do, to, to resum the Borel transform in a disk. Then we do the analytic continuation, and then we do the integral. This is the, the technical steps that you need to do to resum, as they say, this perturbative series. An important point, of course, here is that A should be positive, or more generally, that this function here should have no singularities on the real, on the real axis. And this is true for the scalar theories. This is called, when, when this happens, perturbative series are called Borel summable. But there are, of course, cases, for instance, gauge theories, in which there are singularities on the real positive axis. This is the case of gauge theories. And in this case, uh, there is an additional problem because the perturbatives are not Borel summable because you arrive here, but here you get a sum which has singularities on the real axis and then you don't know how to do the integral to go back to, to, the, to the function that you want to compute. So just to give you some uh, numbers, these are the, the numbers. And let's look first, let's forget about the, the last years, but just see what was happening in 1998. Well, in 1998, as you can see, the fixed dimension expansion for the Ising model, for the exponent in the Ising model, was really the most precise estimate. So the fixed dimension expansion up to, I mean, 20 years ago, was really the most precise method to obtain critical exponents. It was better than Monte Carlo, because Monte Carlo at the time, the best Monte Carlo estimate was this one, and apparently, the quoted error here is smaller. Hmm? So up to 20 years ago, the method was really the optimal method to determine the, the critical exponents. 
better than the epsilon expansion, here the error was, was significantly larger. Of course, things changed in the last 20 years. First, because of course, from five loops, we get, went to seven loops for the epsilon expansion. So the epsilon expansion is now more precise and the new result is here. Apparently there is a factor of 10 improvement in the errors. I don't know if it's really true, but this is what is quoted. And then we have another field theory method, which is the conformal bootstrap, which is very precise. It's also a field theory method, but it's not perturbative, completely different. And of course, also Monte Carlo simulations are significantly improved. And nowadays, you see, we have a complete agreement between Monte Carlo method and conformal bootstrap method. They give results which are in perfect agreement. We've quoted errors. I say quoted errors because I will discuss at the end the meaning of the errors. They have similar quoted errors. So this is the status of the art for or the IC model. Of course, the perturbation theory can be used to do many other things. You do not need to compute only critical exponents. This is just something that we did 20 years ago in which we computed with a different, with a variety of methods, the structure factor for fluids. Here there are uh, experimental data for carbon dioxide, which are here, numerical data, Monte Carlo data on a variety of system, and then field theory predictions. And you can see that all the results fall on top of each other. Field theory, numerical data, and uh, experimental data. So field theory is also useful to compute uh, real uh, functions that you compute in experiment. This is the, the, the quantity, which is the structure factor, which is the quantity which is computed in scattering experiments as a function of the, uh, of the momentum. What are the, the best experimental estimates of critical exponents? Well, the best experimental estimates of critical exponents are usually obtained in fluids. We think of critical exponents, for instance, at the Ising model, as a system to describe magnetic systems. Unfortunately, magnetic systems are not nice from the experimental point of view, because the Ising model, for instance, is really an idealization of what a real magnet is, and effectively, it does not really describe, it's, it does not really describe a, a real magnet because for instance, a real magnet, for instance, there are dipolar interactions. From a numerical point of view, dipolar interactions are a factor of, if I remember correctly, 30 in typical, uh, in typical metals, smaller than the exchange interaction. So as long as the distance from the critical point is less than 10 to minus six, they don't really play a role. But then if you go a little bit, I mean, if the difference in temperature decreases, they become more important because bipolar interactions are long range interactions. While the exchange interaction is short range, really short range in most of the magnetic systems. And then of course, there are also distortions due to the lattice. So we are really speaking of, a, of an Ising model, but then there are subleading corrections induced by several other causes. So it's very difficult to get precise results out of magnetic system. So most of the high precision estimates of the critical response are obtained in fluids. In fluids, all these problems are absent, but there is one additional problem in fluids, of course, which is the presence of gravity. The presence of gravity is, is written here. Uh, you have to, to do, the, sim, to do the, the, the experiment, you have to fix the pressure. This is the, the crucial point at the critical value. So you have to have P equal PC. But of course, when you have gravity, you have the hydrostatic pressure, the usual phenomenon that is discussed in courses of thermodynamics. The pressure decreases exponentially with the height. And so it means that you have a vessel, the pressure is not constant in the vessel. The pressure is a little bit higher at the bottom, a little bit smaller in the top. And this gives what is called the rounding in high precision experiment. So if on the earth, you never see the divergence of uh, some, for instance, of the is isobaric term compressibility, you just see something which smooths out because of the fact that the pressure changes continuously with the height inside the vessel. What is the way out? Well, of course, doing experiments in microgravity, which means that you prepare your experiment and you fly your experiment on, 
on the space station or in some other things in such a way that the, that, uh, the gravity is absent. And these experiments have indeed been done for helium-4. So this is a collection of experiments. Two major experiments were done, one in 1992 and one in the year 2000. The first one was done on the, on the space shuttle, and the second one was done on the ISS. The, the group was a Pasadena, California group, and they were able to obtain results for helium-4, you, you see here, up to differences in temperature of order 10 to minus 8, which is a very tiny number. So we are controlling the distance from the critical point up to the, to the 10 to minus 8. This is a logarithmic scale because not for because the it's mostly logarithmic the behavior is mostly logarithmic not really logarithmic it's mostly logarithmic because we see alpha is very small so they obtain estimates of the exponent alpha and this is the their estimate here which is minus o one two seven with a very tiny error of course the error is extremely tiny and it was very difficult to obtain a result of the same quality. Field theory estimates gave this number here, which was a little bit different, but still within errors in agreement, nothing very serious. But then in the year 2006, uh, with my collaborators in Pisa and uh, the Boston University group, we did simulations, independent simulations, and for some luck, we obtained exactly the same number but with different errors, but both numbers were inconsistent with the uh, experimental result. And, uh, okay, I, I, at the time uh, we received the full, date, the, full, uh, the full set of data from the experimentalist. I did the analysis of the full set of data. My impression at the time was that these data were just analyzed in a very poor way and uh, the errors were grossly underestimated. And there was also another funny thing that this data, which are, okay, they are advertised as uh, microgravity data, indeed contain two sets of data. The data from 10 to minus two up to 10 to minus five are indeed Earth data. In this region, they think that the rounding is irrelevant. And then from 10 to minus five up to 10 to minus eight are indeed real microgravity data. But then when you, when you look at the errors, the Earth data is a very, have very tiny errors. The microgravity errors have very large, which means that when you feed the data, you can just throw away all the microgravity data and nothing changes. So my impression was that, okay, the microgravity data were completely irrelevant. The experiment was really doing, I mean, and the analysis up to 10 to minus five, errors were somewhat underestimated. And indeed, this was essentially, my idea was indeed confirmed by numerical the recent numerical simulations, they are in perfect agreement, and also the conformal bootstrap. The conformal bootstrap gave something, gave a result which was in complete agreement hmm, in 2020. And, and you see it's, complete, it's in complete agreement with the older estimate, same type of error. Okay, so I, I thought up to two years ago that the problem was solved. The problem is with the experimentalists that are not really able to do the, the fits mm, and estimate the errors. But then in near 2021, there was this analysis of the seven loop epsilon expansion, which obtained something completely different. Okay, I didn't really reanalyze, didn't have time to reanalyze the data just to, to verify that the errors quoted here make sense. But if you trust that quantity, this reopens the problem because this new estimate is in full agreement with the, with the experimental result. It is in complete disagreement, mostly in complete disagreement, of course, it's a question of error bars, but it's mostly in disagreement with all other numerical estimates and the conformal booster method result. Of course, the conformal booster method is just a method which does not really have a good control of the errors because they try plug in numbers and, and check what comes out. It's not a real and a method that can be systematically improved to see if 
mm, the, the results are stable. So we don't really know if this number here, three, really makes sense. But it's nice that it agrees with all the other methods. So here we don't know. So I conclude with one last slice, slide, which is a little bit, so it's, it's a slide that I often include because it has a, a nice uh, sociological interest, I think. And this tells you the story of the estimates of this exponent, exponent gamma. We don't really care to know about what this exponent is with the years. And as you can see that numbers decrease as time goes on. Mm? But if you look at given time, all numbers are always in agreement. Mm? So if you look around here in the early, early 90s, essentially all methods were just predicting some points 161. They're all in agreement. Field theory is in agreement, high temperature is in agreement, uh, Monte Carlo is in agreement. Then time passes by, numbers begin to decrease, but they all begin to decrease. High temperatures begin to decrease, field theory begins to decrease, Monte Carlo begins to decrease. And there is even a funny thing that these blue numbers are exactly the same perturbative series. It's just a reanalysis of the same perturbative series. And after a few years, they keep decreasing. We just take the same data. And a few years later, we decide they're a little bit lower than what we expected a few years before. And these two numbers here are the same group. This, well, I, I cannot really say what color is that, but the 93 Monte Carlo and, the two, and 206 Monte Carlo, they are exactly the same group. They give two results, which are 10 error bars, one from the other, but they're happy. The, the error is always very small. They don't care. Mm -hmm. So what is the, the, the truth about it? Well, now again, they're all in agreement. Mm -hmm. One, 1 1.57 essentially. But if this is the true number, the true asymptotic number, well, we don't know. I mean, it may be that 20 years from now that we'll keep decreasing and we get 56, I don't know. Mm. The real problem, what, what, is, what do we learn from this? That sometimes you look at the data mm, at the statistical errors and everything looks nice, but the real source of error in all these computations is the systematic. Is the problem that you don't know the corrections that you are missing in, your, in, your, in the form that you use in the fit. Whenever you fit the data, you assume that your function can be parameterized in a certain way. And of course there are missing pieces and you don't know how those missing pieces influence the result because sometimes you don't even know what those missing pieces are. You don't know how to parameterize them correctly. And if you don't have that information, we are really unable to provide a, a real uh, precise uh, estimate of the error. So the real reason is the, the knowledge, the fact that we don't, that many of these estimates, people did not include scaling corrections, for instance. Mm -hmm. Of course, in all these years, we now know much better what are the possible sources of systematic errors. So I think that now we have included most of them in, uh, in the analysis, in, in the fits, but of course we cannot be sure for that. So it is still possible that something the unexpected will happen and will explain these differences. So at present for the helium-4 uh, experiment, we don't really know. We need, uh, need to work a little bit harder, first to check the epsilon expansion result to have an independent check of those numbers, just to see how reliable they are. And then uh, maybe doing something more, uh, I mean, some numerical simulation which will further increase the errors uh, in such a way that we, we will be able to see if those discrepancies are still there. So to conclude, I think I'm in time. So here I have just to, to, to say what I've done, I have just reviewed these two very important pieces of, of work of Giorgio. The first one, um, I, I never worked on it, so I don't really know how, how to put uh, it in context now, but I've seen just by looking at the most recent citation, is still very much of interest for mathematicians, for instance, that want to, to have precise definitions of field theory. Because in this way, uh, you have a non-perturbative, well-defined method to, uh, to define a field theory. So I think there is still a lot of interest 
in those that want to define quantum field theories precisely for the first paper. The second one has been a very useful tool in the last 40 years uh, for the calculations of critical quantities. Mm? And up to 20 years ago, it was really the method of choice. Mm? If you wanted something precise, the method that should be used was the fixed dimension expansion. That was the method which was providing the most precise estimates in the field. It was much more precise than the epsilon expansion, technically much more easier, much easier to use because you don't have to deal with all those divergences. And it was certainly much uh, more precise than Monte Carlo simulations. Nowadays, of course, uh, Monte Carlo simulations have improved a lot. So they're, they are much more precise and provide much more uh, uh, precise estimates. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the very nice and insightful uh, presentation. So comments, questions? Well, thank you, Andrea. The presentation was very nice and inspiring. I have a few comments, if you don't mind. One is the fact that you were describing at the end that the theory is for the experiment of following the theory. And when the theory change, also experiment do change. And that, I don't know if you remember, but that was happened, I think, in the 70s with a very famous computation problem, the G minus two of the electron, or the moon, or the moon, maybe. I was, I was too young. Uh, yes, I, I think that was the G minus two of the moon or the electron, I don't remember, but uh, there was a two loop computation that was wrong because they have made a mistake in the, in the, in the computer, maybe a multiplicity factor or something like that in the diagram. And the experiment were in very good agreement with the theory. After the, the result was the theory changed because it was Kinoshi and out from the, the mistake. And the, the experiment gradually drifted <laughs> toward the, the the experiment by many groups towards the good the theoretical uh, um, point. And the argument was the following, that if you do the analysis and you that, uh, experimentally you find what the theory predicts, you tend to stop the analysis at that moment because everything is. If you find something that's different from the theory, you start to dig on and try to find which form of mistake is there. And if you've done a mistake, you find uh, the mistake. The same so the, this was a, a way famous, uh, a famous effect. The other thing that I would like to comment, one is on the previsible paper on stochastic quantization. The paper was written as a both a version in English and a version in Chinese. I control only the version in English. <laughs> I mean, once I try to, to, to read the, okay, the Chinese is out of my control. And one of the reasons that the paper was written that it was spending two months in China and they wanted to have to write something that should be published on the Chinese uh, newspaper. Indeed, it was published on Physica Simica. So I was, Wu uh, Yunxi was taking care of me with all practical purpose in China. And they said, well, maybe I could write something with Wu Yunxi and I have to pick something that is it's a computation that can be easily done. I mean, can be done in one month <laughs> because uh, we started when uh, something like more than one month. It should not to be difficult, it should be safe to get the result. So I said, well, if we do the computation of, for that case, the result will be certain. So we did indeed, uh, we found the result uh, that was the reason that was published on that thing. So the other thing that uh, you may, you clearly not notice is that uh, the Kavjis lectures were published uh, seven years later. Now, the reason of five is, is six years later because they were finally written as a Columbia preprint in 74. The reason is the following. The, there was a school at, at KJC in 73 where many old people 
known people working in statistical mechanics was there. There was Wilson, there was, I think, a cousin of, but I'm not sure, certain was Lebovitz, Lieb, and so on, Berzen, and, so, and others. And uh, everybody was waiting every, for the written version of Wilson lecture note. Ever, the Wilson lecture note never arrived. <laughs> People have been waiting for two years, uh, two, and after two years, uh, three years of waiting for which selection note, everybody, the publishers, and they, they said that maybe the, everything was too old <laughs> and, they, and the volume was cancelled. <laughs> so at that moment, I was working on completely different things. And so that's the reason that was pressed and did not at the time to who corrected the old stuff. And after, because the version that you publish is different from the election note because there was something that was irrelevant that was cut off and so on. And that's the reason for which appeared so late. So late. Okay, thank but, you. But, but this is the why it didn't get citations. Yes, yes. Because if you look at the paper in the 70s, it's, it's always cited. Oh, oh, the last things, you mentioned the work of Nickel. I think I was completely amazed by the work of Nickel because they were computing, and not only they were computing file loops with the computer of 1878, but they were computing with six decimal figures. And they all come out exact because now they are completely checked. Yes, and they are all this, exact. All the all yes, the quoted was, numbers are all correct. I did not. I think that there was a mix. I think that what what they were doing is part of the computation analytically because a lot of momentum integral and yes. three dimension in even dimension can be done because they correspond to some integral of yes. sine and so on. And after the rest, they were doing numerically, but a lot uh, of pre-analytic work was done with the five. Loop diagram. Six, 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 uh, six, six. Should be one hundred. I don't know. Oh, no, there, there are. I, I think there were something like one thousand six loop di five six loop diagrams for the beta function. So it's it's a huge number. One thousand diagrams. No, 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 no. Less than one thousand diagrams. For for the beta functions. Well, well I don't know. We have yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To check. It's 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 a lot of. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Since it's so small, uh, even if you take, uh, as they did experimentally, six sort of magnitudes, uh, actually what you little. get is one tenth of order in Y. Yeah. You can just imagine it's a logarithm. Exactly. So how can you put a, a, an error on the fifth digit in, in that situation? It looks ridiculous. Exactly. In, indeed, I didn't, I didn't really say that the, the results, the Monte Carlo results didn't really measure alpha, but rather nu. And then alpha was obtained uh, using hyperscaling because otherwise you don't really get alpha with that precision. This is a problem of the experiment because yeah. they measure really the, the specific heat. And exactly. so they, they, exactly. they pretend to have access directly to alpha, but exactly. it's so small that- uh, Yeah, and uh, it, I mean, if you do re the reanalysis, you don't really understand how the, that error can be justified. But uh, even, even what you told that, you about the, Given what you told us about the relevance or irrelevance of uh, space measurement, yeah. did they do well to cancel the 2006 uh, flight or not? I mean, would, would they... it, it was really scheduled. I, I mean, I remember having an, a mail exchange with Lipa, which was the, the principal investigator, and he said, yeah, well, they just postponed, 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 but then, but then it was postponed forever. And, and... Thank you, Andrea, for the very nice uh, presentation. I have uh, a question uh, and uh, a small comment. The question is, when you say that Monte Carlo method improved, uh, do you mean that we are able to run Monte Carlo with better computers, uh, with better algorithms, but the error, I expect, that works in the same way? 
No, but the problem, the, um, improvement in Monte Carlo goes in two ways. The most important one is lattice size. Because as, as I told you, the main problem is the systematics. Mm? So if you want to really get rid of the systematics, you need larger and larger lattice sizes. So this is where the, the improvement comes in. Then second thing, of course, people realize that you can do some work on, uh, on, the, on the action. So you don't really use the standard action that uh, is appropriate for the IC model, but you get what is called an improved action in which some scaling corrections are approximately small um, or negligible. And, uh, and then of course, also the, the time, which means that the error bars for each lattice size are smaller. So you, you, you improve things in three different ways. Two are relevant for the systematics, which is the main source of error. Larger lattice sizes and better actions, better uh, Hamiltonians. And second thing, of course, also the error for each given size are smaller than previously. Okay. And I want to add the comment about the question of the error. Obviously, this does not explain the, the, the funny fact that the error decreases. But in general, when you make any computation with uh, where you have to sum anything uh, that requires floating point uh, arithmetics, even if you use uh, the same binary, I don't say I don't say the same source. If you so use the same binary on two different generation computer, you you will not get a bit to two bit identity. Yeah, but this is a Monte Carlo simulation. I mean, we have a stochastic. But, I mean, um, this we, is a stochastic approach, so I don't think that. I mean, 16, I mean, here we are, we're just having results that and we errors of 10 to minus six. So 10 to minus 16, of course, people has to be careful, for instance, when you do averages. So averages should be done appropriately just to avoid uh, some, I mean, some addition of, uh, to obtain a, a nice, I mean, a bad error because you are adding small numbers to large numbers. I mean, there are a few tricks which, are commonly used to avoid these problems of procedure. Uh, yeah, but if, even if you use uh, all the tricks, uh, you cannot get the perfect reproducibility. So when you no, run no, that, 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 I agree. But so, okay. Other comments, questions? If not, let's thank again Andrea and. The coffee break.